I'm Kerry. I'm going to talk to you about consecration. But tonight is a little different, so I hope you're ready. I hope this isn't too heavy. So grip your seat, look at your neighbor and say, hang on for dear life. <laughs> consecration. What is it? It's a solemn dedication to a special purpose or service. The act or ceremony of separating from a common to a sacred use. Or devoting or dedicating a person or thing to the service and worship of God. Consecration does not make a person holy, but it declares it to be sacred or devoted to God for a divine service. I think we should turn down those lights a little bit. It's just not like Saturday night. I turned them up a little bit for communion in the middle of the house. Can you just turn that down a little? There. Dark. That's comfortable. <laughs> just like some places I used to frequent. Lawson Heights Pentecostal Assembly uh, participates in prayer and fasting uh, weekly, monthly, and yearly. Uh, every year, Lawson Heights usually has uh, a prayer and fasting time, January 1st, for about 14 days, two weeks, I think they do it. I've never been part of one, but it is a, a yearly uh, dis conscious decision to do that. Uh, they do it monthly, uh, every third week. They do a prayer and fasting weekend. And next weekend is actually Peggy Kennedy and her husband are coming here for a weekend of prayer and fasting. So if you get ready, ready for that, it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So we look forward to that. And as well as a weekly time, every Wednesday night or Wednesday, we have a time of, of fasting and prayer. So, and we pray right over here. Uh, please come out. Everyone is welcome. Um, it's a great time of connection and, and of talking to God intimately. And so, we want to remember tonight after the sermon. Very special time after the sermon. And we're going to do it right here. And I want you to start thinking about questions based on our topic tonight. Based on relationships. Based on your relationship, something you've heard or, or, or thought about, a problem you've had in your life. Uh, something you're struggling with, with, with your spouse, with your family. And there's going to be three experts come up here. And they will handle your questions expertly. So start preparing them. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm happy about posting my own phone number up there, <laughs> but uh, it's a risk I had to take for tonight. Oh, I've been retweeted. Cool. <laughs> my ego is boosted now. And so consecration is a parallel to Lent, which is a solemn religious observance in the liturgical calendar of many Christian denominations, begins on Ash Wednesday and covers a period of approximately six weeks before Easter Sunday. And the traditional purpose of Lent is the preparation of believers through prayer, penance, repentance, almsgiving, atonement, and self-denial. Self-denial. We're going to focus mostly on that tonight. Uh, this event, along with its pious customs, are observed by Christians in the Anglican, Lutheran, Methodist, to Roman Catholic traditions. Who comes from here tonight? Anglican, Lutheran, Methodist, or Roman Catholic traditions? Put up your hand. Wow, that's a good number. Significant. Now, consecration, Lent, sounds kind of painful. Why on earth would I want to be involved in something like this? What's the motivation? Why, why would I be motivated to take part in something like this? To get an insight into the answer, uh, let's look to the Old Testament and the book of Joshua. Joshua 3, verse 5. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things amongst you. Now, we looked at this same scripture last week, and, and, and Jordan and, and Barry expounded on it a little bit. But we're going to use it as our base text for the whole series. And so be prepared to hear a little bit more about that. So this scripture, it sounds like there's an upside. That the Lord will do amazing things amongst you. Uh, there's something in it for me, maybe a reward, possibly. Um, this is good. Uh, I'm a foreign businessman. And so labor and uh, honest 
labor and an effort for an exchange or reward for compensation. It's a philosophy I can sort of get my head around. Um, I like to see amazing things too, uh, amazing amounts of money. I, I like to see that. <laughs> Tell your neighbor right now, you're amazingly good looking. <laughs> Lance, you're amazingly good looking. Now, last week at church, we spoke about consecration. We defined it, and we began to discover what it means for you and me. This week, we're going to dig a little deeper. We're going to look at devoting and dedicating ourselves to God in our relationships and the possibility of healing, wholeness, renewing, and regenerating our relationships with our spouses, our family, our friends, and coworkers. Tonight, we're going to discuss consecration and relationships. My name is Carrie, yeah. and I'm a hypocrite. I'm a person who acts in contradiction to his professed beliefs or feelings. I say things, but I sometimes I don't do them. I will call people, I will say that I will call people, but I don't. I feel bad for a while, and then eventually I get over it. I have relational struggles with my family of origin. And up until I knew Christ, many of my relationships were ones of self-centeredness and very fleeting. I treated friends, family, and acquaintances for what they could do for me. Knowing Christ and following him has given me a model that I've come to trust. And Christ, throughout his life and ministry, he exemplified a life of submission, surrender, and sacrifice. This is what is at the heart of this time of consecrating our relationships. Submission, surrender, and sacrifice. This will be a time if you choose to commit to this time, that we will live outside of our natural desires, to be focused on the needs of the ones we love and living in a constant personal awareness of those things that take us away from that constant love. Now today in the West, we live in an increasingly individualistic, self-centered society. From our social habits, our, like personal computers, gaming, social media. We drive alone. We live very separate lives, even in our own families. Our houses have more rooms, but our families are smaller. Kay Arthur says unapologetically, our society is filled with runaways, dropouts, quitters. The epidemic of walking away has hit our land with effects as devastating as the bubonic plague, and it has destroyed millions of effective lives and relationships. We are so self-centered that we have ceased to lay down our lives for others. We have seen others faint or walk away, and we have followed in their weakness. And when we walk away from relationships or from problems, we walk to things that fulfill our ego our inner man, that inner man that hungers and thirsts for meaning and nourishment. And when that man doesn't get it, he will turn to the closest, fastest solution to ease his discomfort. Addictions flourish in our society. Drugs, alcohol, social media, food, gluttony, I went to uh, Asian Buffet last night, speak, speaking of food and gluttony. And I took my, my friend Kadesh, a uh, Pakistani who lives in Kuwait, who was here for a couple months. And he had one little plate of food, and I had two and dessert. I think there's a little bit of addict in all of us. Jason Lutz the philosopher and existentialist, 
you may know him or you may not, said, the only thing this world can offer for the existential suffering of desert wandering are the anesthetics of entertainment, distraction, and vice. No doubt they may grant you temporary relief from pain. However, these things can do nothing about the source of your suffering and in the long run will leave you feeling more empty than when you started. Any amens there? As far as scripture goes, I'm going to go to James 4, 1 to 4, and then 7 and 8. And if you look at this scripture, if you listen and read it with me, you'll see many instances in here that I'm not going to cover them all in detail, but just pay attention that there's many things here that lead us away from healthy submission and healthy love to each other and God. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you do not get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Submit yourselves, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Serious stuff. As we can see in this very wise book of James, the desires for worldly things set us in conflict with those around us. Friendship with the world divides us from God and from each other. James urges the reader then to submit in verse 7. To purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, submission is a conscious act of surrender of the self. The ego and its desires for worldly satisfaction are laid down like a sacrifice. I think about when Jesus came into Jerusalem on Palm, Palm Sunday. And they laid down the palms and they, they lay, took off their coats and they laid down their cloaks. And a cloak in ancient, in Israel at that time of Jesus, it signified who they were. It signified what they did, their, their position in, in the society, their, their job. Their cloak identified them. And when Jesus came in, they took off their cloaks and they laid them down. They sacrificed who they were for this man. Tell someone, lay it down. In my ministry at the Correctional Center, I've come to realize the devastating impact that broken, abusive relationships have on the human psyche. Just the other day, I won't name this, this inmate, but he, he shared about his normal. And, and I thought I had a pretty good idea what some of these guys walk in as children and as young adults and then as they get in their 20s and 30s, but this guy kind of changed my idea of what was normal uh, in his life and what is possible that some people live through on a day-to-day -day basis. The normal in his family and those in the community around him was one of abuse, neglect, emotional, physical, sexual, mental abuse on a daily basis. Healthy relationships, healthy relationships are crucial to normal human functioning. Dr. Gabor Mate believes that broken relationships are a major contributing factor in brain development. This is science now. A major factor in brain development and in the success of future relationships. Resulting behaviors like addictions are simply the effects of the changes in the brain caused by these broken relationships. 
Dr. Maté's uh, colleague, Johan Hari, would go to the extent of saying, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is human connection. These scientists have come to see the close connection that God has formed into our bodies when we were made, our brains and our souls, a part of us that has to have deep human connection in order to be whole, healthy human. As I learn more about the science of human interaction and the damaging effects of relational abuse, and not even relational abuse, just neglect, lack of focus, lack of consciousness about what's going on in the people's lives around us. It lends force to God's words that urge us to submit to each other's desires, to forgive one another, to make every effort to stay in, to stay in and develop healthy, whole relationships, to love maturely and unconditionally. Ephesians 5.1 Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. If you don't remember anything else, remember that. Any motivation that we have to take on this consecration commitment may be enhanced by God's promise of reward, as we saw in Joshua 3.5 five where I will do amazing things amongst you if you consecrate yourself to me. But ultimately the depth of our commitment to make improvements in our relationships with our spouses, children, friends, and extended family should flow out of our relationship with Christ. He is the only reward that is lasting and deep enough to satisfy us. God's ways are different they're different from our ways. They set a high standard. He wanted the people of Israel, ancient Israel, to always be together. They were made for community. If you read the Old Testament, if you read Exodus, and, and as the Israelites left, left Egypt, the connection to each other was, that's, that's what he cared about. He wanted them to be together. Even though, even though he had to teach them, he had to train them, he had to tear them down and grow them as a people. He wanted them to be together. If you ever see a symbol or a drawing of the camp in the desert where the tent of the tabernacle is the center of the tribe, this is hundreds of thousands of people moving through the desert as they left Egypt. Has anyone seen the movie Exodus? It was pretty good, I thought. Four out of five. These people, the tent is in the middle as they camp out every night. And the tribes are arranged around the tent. On top, one, two, three. On the bottom, one, two, three. On the sides, one, two, three. One, two, three. And the tent right in the middle. Up, down, side to side. Up, down, side to side. Looks like a cross to me. God's design for us has always existed. And his hints when he gives them are amazing. Our model in relationships must be Jesus. His life, his death, his resurrection, they give us a portrayal of consecration. In order for Jesus to achieve this, he had to be constantly submitted to his Father's will. He says, I will only do what the Father tells me. He had to surrender his ego desires, thy will be done, and sacrificially give his life to be in relationship with any who choose to follow him, his disciples. His devotion to his Father and those his Father gave him was complete, whole, and undivided. Jesus often used the metaphor of the wedding, particularly the bride, 
to describe his intimate relationship to the church. And in Revelation 19.7, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. A wedding done in the Christian tradition is still, even today in our modern world, is still a beautiful example of consecration in a relationship. The bride has spent hours, days, making herself ready. Years. She has kept herself pure, and where she was not pure, she made reconciliation. She buys the finest dress. She washes. She puts on makeup. Hours and hours and much effort put into hair and makeup. She is, in essence, cleansing and purifying and devoting herself for this time. She enters the church. She's the center of attention. All in white. All in white. Purified. Dedicated. Submitted to the bridegroom completely. Forever. And the bridegroom recognizes his bride. He sees the depth of her love, her beauty. He promises to have and to hold in sickness and in health till death do us part. They submit their lives to each other. They surrender their own wills and desires for a will that is greater than them both. They come together under God. Think of your dating life, you men. Does anyone remember that far back? I'm kind of still in that mode, actually. And so, uh, me and my girlfriend, we, uh, we have dates. <laughs> remember your dating life. Those who have been married for a while, you, you should still recall how you primped and the preparation and the anxiety the sweaty hands, the cold feet, the raw excitement as you get ready to go out with this girl that you've had your eye on for a while, but you'd never had the chance till now. Have you ever noticed those older couples? They've been married for 30, 40, 50 years. How they seem to radiate into one person they start to talk alike. They start to look alike. They start to dress alike, especially those ones in the middle. <laughs> they start and end each other's sentences. They're so in tune with each other. They have, over time, surrendered their ego, their self, for the relational purpose of the team, together, they have submitted completely to one another and made something beautiful in the process. We think it looks a little weird, but it strikes us that way because it's so rare and magnificent. <laughs> in working at the jail, the level of recidivism or repeat offending is significant. Um, Men are regularly re returning under fresh sentences from court and getting arrested. Uh, even in the short time I've been there, I've seen guys come back and back. I if I'm a vol as a volunteer, I'm not careful. I, I could lose hope um, in the possibility of change. It's easy to find skeptics that don't believe in change. Those who doubt that real human change is possible are a dime a dozen. It's not hard to see the negative or to find the negative. They doubt the miraculous workings of the Spirit as well. The ability of man to change. But human transformation is a fact Scientists in the field of addictions 
alone have seen how brain pathways have been formed and solidified by years of drug abuse can be changed and redirected to embrace healthy behaviors that were previously thought impossible. Teen Challenge is a great example of one of many programs that bring per lasting personal transformation through a period of intense consecration. The young men who enter this program don't do it just to get clean. They commit to this time to learn how to walk in the light of God's words in a way that will bring healing to the relationships. It's not about the drugs. It's about the life with other people. Their wives and kids and moms and dads who love them have been betrayed, stolen from, lied to. Trust has been broken. The goal is reconciliation of trust. The benefits of this personal healing has a domino effect that brings redemption to relationships with friends and family. Amen, Tommy? Absolutely. Teen Challenge candidates are set apart for a season to learn new skills, a new way of thinking, new healthy emotions that go with a healthy, right relationship. New actions are the result. If it is done with commitment to the lessons learned, a lifetime of quality living becomes a reality. This time apart, is it a year, Tommy? Year. One year? This time apart involves submission to a system that is designed to bring change. The surrendering of one's own pride and sacrifice of one's current way of life is a requirement. Rick Warren says, it takes as little as 30 days to form a new habit, good or bad, but it takes effort, intentionality, and hope. Kyle Smith, a young man in college, um, he was terribly impressive. <laughs> um, when I think back about who I was when I was 22 and who I see this young man, I'm uh, wholly impressed. He shared about his relationship with me, about with his parents. Uh, since they live in Winnipeg, he's away from them. Uh, and for the first time in his life, actually, he's away from Winnipeg. And it's caused a major adjustment. But in this young man's disciplined lifestyle, uh, I've personally been impacted as I observe his dedication to communicate and grow this relationship with his parents, ongoing relationship. He sets his phone alarm to call them on a consistent, ongoing basis. He, maybe I'm the only weird one. Does anyone else <laughs> do this? He, he continues to mine the depths of their knowledge and, and the wisdom, and, and he does his best to love them, and they love him. But he's, he's also just staying connected. It's not about what you talk about. It's just about being connected. Staying healthy. They talk to each other all the time on Skype. It costs them nothing except time. They use the tools that are available for godly purposes. There are many other examples of, of practical consecration of our relationships that we will look at, that we will look at more in the discussion time. And the experts that I've paid a large amount of money to will be able to answer your practical questions at that time. The leadership of the church of uh, Lawson Heights has felt led to dedicate this time of consecration um, as a time of examination and reflection as well. The common scripture for communion is 1 Corinthians 11:28, and it says that everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now, I'm not going to ask you if you did that tonight when we took communion. I won't ask that question. In essence, in this scripture, though, what Paul is saying is that before we commune with or come to meet with Jesus, we should look at our lives. And in this time of consecration and preparation or Lent, it's a time to examine our relationships with God and each other in preparation to meet Jesus on that important day in the Christian calendar, Easter. 
And so that six weeks, that 40 days from February 19th to March 26th, I think it is, is a time of examination and preparation to commune with Jesus at Easter time. Communing with Jesus takes place with the Holy Spirit on any day of the year, any moment. Tonight, I hope, you are communing with the Holy Spirit. However, the very special days of remembrance that recall his death and resurrection, like Good Friday and Easter, are considered holy days in many traditions. Jesus urged his followers to examine your life before you commune with him. So let us take this time of consecration, this, this Lenten season, to examine these things and discern where we need to change, who we need to forgive, and dedicate to a transformation that's accessible. We can change. Lord, give us the strength. Give us the strength we need to love our wife, our husband, our moms and dads, our children, our friends, our co-workers. Give us the strength to love them better, to know them better, to stay connected or reconnect with them. As we connect, as we commit to this upcoming time, commit to submitting, surrendering, and sacrificing for a season, we commit to developing a relational wholeness and health. C.S. Lewis wrote about God. He said, You have not chosen one another, but I have chosen you for one another. The Bible puts extreme importance on living in right relationship. Not just living, but living in peace and mutual submission. God's ultimate plan is not, is for relational wholeness because he knows that this is what he designed us for to love him and each other. Our opening verse, Joshua 3, 5. Let's return there. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord would do amazing things amongst you. And the parallel verse in James 4, 10 is humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. Consecrate, humble. In both verses, there's a command and a reward for consecrating oneself to submitting, surrendering, sacrificing. This is not just about giving up chocolate for 40 days. Please. Unless you have a real chocolate problem. Or surrendering social media habits for a season and then returning to them right after Easter. Is that what Lent is really about? I hope that's not why I'm up here. Instead of omission, let's look at this 40 days of consecration as a time of commission, to be committed to commencing a new habit, one of giving up your own needs for that of another, to put relationship ahead of your right to be right, to surrender your pride and position and lift someone else up, to sacrifice one's emotional needs for the emotional needs of another. Let's take these 40 days to form a new habit of mutual submission, surrendering one's ego needs and sacrificing rightness for relationship. Let us submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Rick Warren says, Christianity is not a religion or a philosophy, but a relationship and a lifestyle. And that the core of that lifestyle is thinking of others as Jesus did instead of ourselves. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this, this time together. Lord, I, I pray you'd take, take us deep. God, this is for me. God, uh, have mercy, Lord. And lead us gently. Lead us, lead us into wholeness. Lead us into healthy, healthy relationships, Father. Where we are weak, Lord, where, where we are broken, where there's disconnect, Lord, I pray that you would connect, that you would renew, that you would make us new again, Lord. God, I pray for energy to take up our crosses, 
and strike out and do what you're asking us to do. Lord. We commit to commit to this season of healthy wholeness, seeking right relationship, Lord, with our neighbor, with our brother and sister, with our wife, with our mom and dad. Forgive us where we missed it, and just lead us in this commitment, Lord. We need your strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, I hope you have your questions ready. Bring up the lights just a little bit in the middle house, please, Scott. And we'll ask our experts to come forward. Um, there's, an, there's another mic here. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what happened. Maybe just went went red. I guess. We check the batteries too. Uh, our experts, JoLynn Sloan. Give her a big hand, JoLynn. Woo! Pastor Barry and Pastor Jordan. Check one. Check one. Check one, two. Check one. So our experts were thin, eh? Not very many choices. You can use the mic for your commentary. That way you can maybe compete against Evan. <laughs> so I've got my phone on. You guys got the number, 612-3025. If you want to send in a question, I'd love to hear from you. Um, I think I'm going to start off. Maybe I'll fire one just to get things rolling here today. Pastor Barry, is that working? Got it. I'm an expert. <laughs> Just discuss amongst yourselves come up with a good question uh, or are you on Facebook I was just, I was gonna oh come on an easy one <laughs> so Pastor Barry you got a mic there I do okay I do. Pastor Barry you've been in uh, a married relationship uh, for a couple of years uh, um, 900,000 <laughs> how many years it, it feels like nine. <laughs> nine but, years? But with the wind chill, it's more like 34. Oh, geez. 38. Oh. <laughs> it, so just, it only feels like 34. <laughs> now, please stick to the questions. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Let Evan do the commentary. What, uh, what actions, activities, what uh, kind of consecration... Uh, in your relationship with your wife, have you experienced in the past, or have you committed to um, prayer and fasting? Or go ahead, show us. Do you need? You can act it out if you want. I can, I can act it out. We can do this like like charades or something like that. Um, we've got reminders around the house of, of different things. Okay, mm -hmm. there's there's you know like there's a reminder to take your pills. There's a reminder to do one thing or another. And in, inside the cupboard door, and, and kids, close your ears here, but there's, there's a, a little sticky note that says to state, to pray together, play together, lay together, and, and stay together. Did I get all four? Did I get that right? Okay. okay. The, I should, yeah, yeah, she's the expert. I'm just here. I'm what was that again? Could you repeat those steps? Pray together. Mm -hmm. Play together, lay together, stay together. Ah. Is there any of those you want to expand on at all? No, but, but, but since you asked. 
Uh, I was just discussing, we were at the men's thing this morning, I was talking to, uh, to a fellow, we were talking about a uh, Dr. Emmerich that did the, uh, the Love and Respect book. He said sex is the, uh, the important thing. He said the devil will take and use sex before marriage, that it's the only thing that everybody's striving after, and then after marriage, it's the reverse. And mm -hmm. so uh, either way, he's uh, using, using that to affect our relationships. Ah. So we have a couple texts. I don't know, they're not, uh, the one is not very relevant, but who is Pastor Kerry dating and why? You should ask the person that, actually. Um, what are some things you've done for Lent? What does Lent mean to you personally? Jordan? You... <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, Lent for me it was something that I grew up with growing up in the Catholic Church. Um, for us, it was more about giving something up. I think as a kid, I always just thought it was about giving something up, more like sacrifice, more like just kind of, you know, uh, quitting something for a while, a form of punishment and suffering almost is kind of what it felt like as a, as a teenager and as a young, young child kind of thing. But I've come to see recently more than anything that Lent in and of itself is about giving stuff up. It is about sacrifice, but it's about so much more than that. It's about what happens as you do that and that you fill yourself with more of what God has for you and more of what God wants for you, right? Um, one, one, one pastor I heard preach once said it's almost like you fast from the world and you feast on God, right? You fast from something else and you feast on the things that God has for you. So for me, that's kind of what Lent is. Lent's, Lent's not just about giving something up, even though you will feel a little bit of pain as you do that. And you will, you know, feel, you, you'll know that you're sacrificing, especially if you give up something that you like a lot and that you appreciate. You're going to get that part. But I hope that Lent is more than that. I hope it's more about what God does in your life, what he does in your heart. And, um, you know, in, in, in through that, he'll help you develop new habits. He'll help you to develop new disciplines and new things that he wants from you. Very good. Thank you. Very impressive answers from these experts. Now, those of you who don't have a, a phone with you or a smartphone or anything, Evan is here somewhere. There he is. Uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, just yell out and Evan will uh, come and bring you a mic. Don't everyone yell at once. Okay, I know Tommy had one here. It was, it was pretty good. How long should older Christians date before getting married? <laughs> oh, I wasn't supposed to name your name. This is supposed to be anonymous. <laughs> Oops. Does this change for people who are 20? How long should older Christians date? Jolyn? <laughs> um... Actually, I'm going to kind of take it in a different direction because... You're allowed. Yeah. Uh, and just by the way, I was a little bit hesitant to do this, but I submitted to Carrie and I <laughs> sacrificed myself to be on stage today. So, and I surrendered. So wow. um, I just thought I'd mention that, Carrie. That's, I'm, how I'm, that's, I'm, how you, that's how I'm you get a job at a Bible college. my consecration of relationships <laughs> this evening. Um, <laughs> I kind of, as I was thinking about this topic and, um, and just what, what would I bring to this conversation, it actually did make me think of dating and marriage and um, committed relationships and family and all those things, obviously, cause that's relationships, but um, for some of us and some of you, your relationships may, like Carrie had mentioned, some of your relationships may not have been the most healthy ones in your lives. Your, parent, your relationships with your parents may have been broken. I come from a very broken, dysfunctional home. Um, I don't talk about it a lot because um, God's done a lot of healing in my life, but every once in a while it, it, it comes up and I realize that it's, it's still raw. Um, but what I had to learn in my walk with God and in my dating relationships was how much I was trying to fill my need for God 
because of the lack of love and care that I had in my life, I was trying so desperately to fill that with a relationship. But not just any relationship, it had to be the perfect relationship. Mm. And so what I realized was that I actually, one of my idols was a relationship. And I actually, I look back and I, I look at my, my track record and I had what I would call a love addiction. The high of being in love and the high of seeking after the right person. And I think, I think we don't ever get away from that and some we struggle with more than others because this world is full of lies. It says, you know, this is what you're gonna be happy with and satisfied with, and this is what's going to bring you joy and fulfillment, but it's a big fat lie. It doesn't talk to us about consecrated relationships and commitment and working through the tough times and, um, and grieving and, and healing and hurting through all of the stuff that you might have gone through. So my husband and I, Jeremy, do a big wave. Hi, Jeremy. Um, he's a big part of my story because we had to work through a lot of my own healing and his own healing together before we were even married and even after we were married. And I mean, we have tons of stories that we could share and I'm not gonna take up the whole time, but um, you know, it's not, I, I just wanted to say, it's not always going to be the same for everyone. It's not gonna look the same for everyone. Um, but I think holiness is right relationship. And it's also taking, it's, it's taking a step of faith because I was a commitment phobe, okay? I got married in this church. And as I walked out and we were in the car and Jeremy's like, oh, please don't share this. I was like, what did I do? What did I do? I was terrified because I took it really seriously. And I think everyone should. It's a commitment, it's marriage. I was a little bit freaked out, okay? What if I made the wrong choice? But you, you choose every single day and you trust that God can bless your marriage. Just like the Audrey and, and Bob Meisner who were here, I actually heard a message from them on It's a New Day, and I remember him saying, don't believe the lie that God can't bless your marriage, because it is a holy and consecrated thing. So if anybody ever wants to talk to me about more afterwards or any other time you catch me, I'm, I'm, I'm open, I'm happy to talk about marriage and relationships. Thanks, Jolyn, awesome. Any questions out here? without a smartphone? Or that's scared to text me because I'll have your number then? Um, okay. How about uh, preparing yourself for a relationship? Um, we talked about this in our class the other day. We actually practiced this panel in our, uh, <laughs> in our principles of teaching class, or as we like to call it at Horizon College, pot class. Um, and so uh, the, the question was, <laughs> and Jolyn joined us there, actually. Um, we're, we're talking about relationships. I'm surprised and you didn't fire me from oh, tonight. You were excellent. Your looks go a long way. <laughs> You're cute. <laughs> yes, your husband's right Jeremy. there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes. Oh dear. Okay. Thanks. Next question. I can see this is the last time I'll be doing this panel. <laughs> so, you guys have any other comments up there on uh, on consecration and relationships? I'm just looking for a good question here. Um, what are some good chapters in the Bible to read about consecration? or while practicing consecration. <laughs> I was all excited there. I thought you were going to say, what are good chapters to read about, about marriage? And I was going to say Proverbs 31. Well, about yeah, marriage, that, yeah. That's a good one. Actually, yeah. one, of the, one of the things that we've done for, for years, and actually we've kind of, okay, oh, it's public and everything. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we've, we've kind of fallen away from it over the last little while. But one thing we used to do uh, 
for, for a number of years is every day we would take a proverb, and so today's the 17th, and we would read together Proverbs 17 and go through that chapter. Uh, the good part is that there's about five months that don't have 31 days, and Stella, Stella would get a reprieve for those months. But uh, going through and just spending time in the scriptures to, together is, is a huge thing. Um, we'll spend time each evening is the, the way we end our day is uh, with the scripture. Uh, we try uh, to do the same thing in the morning, but it just really does set a, a tone for the relationship to be working together through the scripture. One other thing that's come up here in a couple questions um, is uh, being unequally yoked. Either a uh, Christian to another religion or a Christian to a non-Christian. Is that still relevant today? Should, should one get married to a non-Christian or to a, someone of another faith tradition? I can speak to that a little bit. Um, Throughout, I mean, I'm getting up there, but I'm not super old yet, but I've seen a lot of uh, friends and family. Pardon? I'm like you, yeah. Um, but I've seen a lot of friends already and family get divorced um, and separated. And it's really devastating to see that with young kids. Um, the one thing that I knew I couldn't sacrifice in a relationship was the man that I was going to marry needed to have a dedication to God, a hunger for God, character, integrity, and hardworking, and funny. Those were kind of, and you know, I had to be attracted to, that's always important. But those were kind of the key things, and I knew that if I chose a man that had those characteristics, that I wouldn't have to be concerned. Because anybody who has a heart for God and has integrity and character, they're seeking to be the best person they could be, and they, they're seeking to be like Christ. So, yes, it's very relevant. If you purposefully choose, they could be great people. I'm not saying that there's people out there who aren't, who aren't created by God, made in the image of God, but the values and the, the formation that the Holy Spirit does in our lives when we surrender our lives to him it doesn't happen the same way with the exact same way as a non-Christian. It's, it's setting yourself up in a sense for failure. And it's, I've just seen it too many times. It's, it's damaging, it's, it's scary, it's painful. And it's not life-giving, it's not fruitful. So I hope that helps. Yep. Someone's asking for a modern a trend, an example of consecration. Um, Jordan, is there anything you can think of that might be a good example in today's context? Of consecration? Yeah, just of... Okay. I will go to the idea of team sports. I um, haven't played them in quite a long time. But the one thing, th there's, there's a bunch of things involved in team sports. A team has to surrender to the will of the coach, right? If they don't do that, then they don't necessarily go under the direction of where he's trying to lead them. Uh, another, another thing with team sports is that it's not all about you. You have other people looking out for you. You have people who are um, trying to better the, the whole team, and that includes you yourself. And so you surrender yourselves to each other in order to benefit the whole group. You can just watch sports on TV, and you can see which team is, is, is looking out for each other and which team is full of a bunch of pe me first people, right? It doesn't take a you know, very hard time to look at that. So to me, that, that's an example of what it means to surrender yourself to something for, for the sake of a cause. And as Christians, what we do is we, we, we surrender our own will and surrender our own desires in order to help other people in much the same way. You know, sometimes you're not going to really feel like going out and hanging out with somebody or going out and, you know, just talking with someone who has some, you know, maybe possibly some deep stuff to talk about or some stuff that you just don't necessarily like engaging. But, you, you know, you, you, you surrender that. You've surrendered that part of yourself to God because you want to be at his service to help other people. So that's, that's kind of a modern example I would think of. Very good. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. We've... Uh, Living Grace Assembly is, is having a service at 8 o'clock, so if you feel like staying for another service, uh, they are having a conference this weekend, so feel welcome to stay. 
And the kids, I think, are getting restless, so we better wrap it up. Uh, Barry, please. Yeah, I just want to make one comment in, in the concerns the question that went to Jolyn. And, and, and I agree 100%. It's very, very valuable. But what happens if you're sitting here and you got here and you have got a, a partner that's not a Christian? What does that look like? And, you know, the scripture talks about that. It's not an impossibility. But it really, I just want to encourage you that, that by being consecrated to, to God, to being set apart, it uh, is possible to walk through those relationships and, and to impact that other life. So, you know, it's, it's wonderful to plan these things in advance and, and say this is the ideal, but there's a lot of people that end up in that circumstance for a variety of reasons. And it's not an impossible thing to walk through. It's, uh, it really is doable, folks. Thanks, Pastor Barry. Okay, well, you have some challenging ideas there, and uh, I hope you guys are blessed tonight. Um, it's a challenging message to put together, uh, but uh, consecration is work. It's a decision, and I know we've all got relational challenges in our lives, so, so take this time seriously and, and ask the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to, to guide you in your decision to, to where do I need to focus? Who, who is broken? What, what relationship is, is struggling in my life? And, and what can I do to, uh, to help remedy this and, and ask God to help you in that area? So I'm just going to pray. Father, I thank you for tonight, Lord. I, I thank you for this teaching that you brought. And God, thank you for ministering to me through my research and stuff. I, uh, I'm challenged. And I pray, Lord, that we would just tie into this thing and, and that we would prepare ourselves for this time of consecration and separation and and submission. And uh, Father, February 19th, this, this six weeks, this 40 days is coming. And I pray we'd start to think about uh, our relationships and uh, to you and, and to those around us. God, just give us, give us help, give us energy to, uh, to do your will and to submit, to bow the knee to, to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go and be the church.